so first of all, um, uh, I want to thank everybody that's come out this morning for giving uh, of your time. And uh, I want to start this event out by saying that um, a good community space builds good community. So um, that's why we're all here today, to talk about what builds a good community and how we can build this community together and uh, whether there's something here that works. So uh, first of all, um, I've got to thank Brian Callahan um, for putting this together. Um, because uh, this stuff just doesn't happen. You don't get an, a world-class um, designer like Fred Kent uh, to come to your town. You don't get a tent like this. You don't get coffee. You don't get tables and chairs without a lot of coordination. And um, Brian um, has been building this community for a long, long time. And I know a lot of us have met in his coffee shop um, uh, to come up with uh, plans and ideas. And so can I just give Brian Callahan a round of applause? Thank you. And I want to thank uh, uh, Michael, uh, the only blood I can see, and, and uh, Peter Fillet for, for sponsoring this event today. We want to thank you guys. Thank you so much. So um, uh, put your hand up um, if you ever went to the Harbour Grill. The Harbour Grill, the Harbour Grill. Okay. Put your hand up if you went to Hellpoint Kitchen. Put your hand up if you went to Hellpoint Kitchen a second time. Right. <laughs> so uh, the Yacht Club is about to leave this location behind us and, and go back to its home. And we're going to be left with an, an empty restaurant in a part of the city dock that I truly believe need some help. So we have an opportunity here to create a private public partnership to maybe achieve something that works for the whole city. So I can tell you I don't support a 70 foot hotel here. I don't support you know, five stories underground garage. But I do support a four story hotel with a rooftop and maybe a couple of floors underground of parking if we can make it work. And if you don't, and that's just my opinion, and, and if you think it's great the way it is, if you think that uh, 150 uh, uh, parking lot, surface parking lot is the best use of this public space, then you are entitled to that opinion. That is okay. We can all, that's what makes this town great. That's what's great about democracy. We all have our opinions and they all matter. But what this is about is about bringing people together to decide on what your city should look like. I campaigned on the City Dock Master Plan. The City Dock Master Plan saw this as an opportunity site. And so it's not about whether Harvey owns this piece of real estate or not. It's about this piece of real estate and this tarmac parking lot that we are sitting on today. And that's why it was important for me to put this event together today so that we could sit here and try to reimagine what could happen here. So I want to thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for caring about this city as much as you, you do. Um, uh, we are, um, I'm so excited to, uh, for Fred to make this presentation. I really wanted Fred to talk a little bit about his, um, uh, his uh, connection to Jane Jacobs. Um, and I can tell you that uh, this man has had his hand in every beautiful, cool city that you've been into in the world. Their firm has had a hand in how they've designed their waterfront and how they've designed that city and how they've programmed space to bring people together and, and, and make these towns the things that we admire. We have a beautiful city here. We're very lucky to live in this city. I feel lucky every single day, especially today because it's so beautiful out there. But we're so lucky to live here. But we need to, you, you, you can't just stop. History doesn't just stop. You have to keep evolving. You have to keep reimagining. And, uh, you know, there used to be oil tankers here. There used to be uh, factories here that, that, um, that canned things. There, there were, uh, you know, produce came in from the eastern shore to this area, and there were, there, were, there were processing plants. So this has changed. 
The circle was a gas station. Things keep moving. But let's just make something that works for everybody so that people can envy how lucky we all are to live here. And thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Now Fred can... <laughs> Uh, so this is uh, very special for me because I think you can have the best waterfront in North America. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> I don't say that lightly because I've worked in every state, uh, all the capitals, all the major cities in the United States, Canada. I've even been to Australia a few times and... Uh, I was there and I saw this guy uh, standing on his head. And you know who it is? It's your mayor. <laughs> so he was going around Perth standing on his head all over the place. And he finally got tired of doing that. So he, he thought he should come north. Uh, and so now he's standing right side up. But you know something? He wants to turn everything upside down to get it right side up, to get from inadequate to extraordinary. So that's the opportunity here. I'm going to say right now that what you have here now is not performing at 20% of what you could get. Now getting there is tough. And so when we came down, we were thinking of a larger area. But as we started looking at it, it's this whole pier and then the area around the market and then Main Street and getting that to perform at a much higher level in a short period of time and then grow it from there is the objective of today. We're gonna break the site down into different destinations and we're gonna have you as teams go out, we're gonna have an evaluation sheet that you can evaluate it in terms of activities and uses, sociability, comfort and image, uh, and you're going to assess it, and then you're going to look at that space. You have to solve the problem of that space. And together with other people, you'll come up with ideas of how to make that space better in the short term. From my point of view, this is about a two-year exercise that will get you to a level you cannot believe. But getting to that level, well, then you'll be able to see where you go the next level. So it's an iterative process. By using this lighter, quicker, cheaper uh, way of activation, you learn by doing, you learn by doing, and then you keep changing things. So you can make mistakes. In fact, so you can be bold and make mistakes, which actually is, very, is really an important part of this process. So we have done this all over the world, and probably I'll show you one of them places is Detroit, downtown Detroit. Uh, that we worked on and were the catalyst for transforming Detroit into the city it, it, it is now and it only started four years ago. So I can't see this thing. So, so here, here he is, uh, you know, right? That's him, right? Standing upside down and uh, and uh, he, he did that all over Perth, and then he had to come up here because there's too much blood getting to his head. Uh, so, uh, great. So placemaking is a, a community process. It's organic and natural. It localizes its economic development, its scale to each community, creates social and place capital. This is a revolution, in a sense, back to common sense, the way we used to live before we got siloed into disciplines. You know, the traffic engineers have become their own audience and they know how to move cars, but they forgot about people. So you, I'm gonna go through how you can systemically change this by, by creating uh, ways to use your public spaces in ways you want, and then how that defines your character, who you are, what your aspirations are, and how you can be part of that and build your community around those places. And you can do this in, in your front yard. We had a, uh, a planner up in Toronto. I was walking back from a meeting, and he said, I put a bench in my front yard. And I said, what happened? And the, and the community went ap apoplectic because they didn't want someone sitting in the front yard of their neighbor. Well, then a second person did it, and that broke the ice, and it transitioned that neighborhood into a place where people were welcome. So the whole concept of just a seat 
a comfortable seat is a radical idea because it speaks a language to people intuitively and they'll know if it, if it works. Kathy's going to show you a, a bunch of these as we go, as we go through this. She's, she's going to sh do the game, and I'm going to show you benchmarks that are so relevant to what you have here, and look at them carefully and see what happened there, because as we go out, you're going to take one of those images and it's going to translate into something that you think could work, okay? And that's what you'll put into your sheet and you'll talk with other people about it. So this is a very important exercise because you are the experts. Uh, we've been all over the place, but we don't know what you should do here. So you have to tell us. You have to tell everyone else. So <clears throat> the exercise is a power of 10 dot exercise. And we don't have enough dots, but uh, some of the tables will be able to do this or we'll figure out a way to do it. Uh, the power of 10 is in this area, you need 10 destinations, and each place, you need 10 places and 10 things to do in each of those. So it's 10 times 10 times 10. Right now, you don't really have those focal points. Like this here is basically an open plaza with some activities on it. But what are the other things that you can do here that will set it up for more to happen? And then around the marketplace, and then you have one of the largest asphalt circles in the world out there that does nothing for the city and how do you make that become part of the downtown and the destination? Right now, it's not working for you. Uh, and then the place game is what we're going to do. Lighter, quicker, cheaper, and then there's other par par parts to this. So the strategy for implementation is lighter, quicker, cheaper. What can you do in one to four months? That's short term. Long term is two years. So short term is what we're working on today. And then you create these energetic anchors of activity, you crowdsource ideas, you make it a movable feast, you get life on the streets and walkways, and you bring the inside out. So those are what we've done in cities around the world, and the impact has been phenomenal in those cities. And the other thing that we really began to realize is that people are deeply nourished by the creating process of creating wholeness. How do we create a wholeness in our lives, in our communities, in our public spaces? That's what communities are all about. The best are about that. So uh, these are the, the, the key areas that we started looking at. West Street. West Street, you know, it's really amazing. We're up there, and you walk along the street. One side, there's no parking on it. And one side has one of the worst buildings in all of Annapolis, which is the uh, Chamber of Commerce or something. And, uh, on the other side are these restaurants and their cars parked there. There's no cars parked on the, on the other side, on the, the ugly building side. So why not move those cars over to the other side, widen the sidewalks by five feet, have cafes uh, out there because there are all these restaurants. And guess what? People attract people. people. Cars don't attract people. People attract people. So if you can see people, you're attracted to them. But if you have all these cars parked there, you don't even know what's going on there. So just that simple, lighter, quicker, cheaper move, and that could be done on Main Street as well. So these little things can have a systemic impact on, this, on your community uh, in ways that you, ca you cannot imagine. And so, uh, oops. so then these are the sites that we're going to be working on. Uh, here at the end of the pier, what I call mid-pier, uh, there's an area right where that uh, plaza is, where the water ends, uh, the marketplace. Then that whole area is really an interesting area where uh, you get your coffee and other things. And then uh, the, the entranceway, Main Street going up, and then in front of the tea house and the liquor store and that and the circle, those are the key areas that if we can figure out how to change them uh, with short-term interventions, uh, they can have a big impact. So uh, I just wanted to say, I know this is controversial, this building, and uh, I, we have a place in Delray Beach, and uh, I am a NIMBY of, of great impact, because I've been all over the world with Kathy. We've been about 9 million miles traveling the world. So, uh, so we, uh, we like this hotel. This is a historic hotel. It is a fantastic place. The woman who owns it is a zealous nut, and she is just she she makes that the center of the city, and yet down the street, probably the richest person in town, uh, 
built a Marriott at the main corner going onto the waterfront. That's a hall of shame. And if you, if you get something like that, and you, and you end up with something like that, I'm going to come and get you. <laughs> that is not, but yes, no, but I mean, the treasure, you know, the treasure that something like that can be in a community is unbelievable. And we don't build them like that. So the, the benchmark that could be done here could be something like that. And I know Peter's listening somewhere. <laughs> so, uh, so the streets, your biggest liability are your streets. Uh, the streets are owned by cars, by traffic, and that's what you've done, is you have let that happen to you, like every other community. And so we, we have this phrase, when you design your community around cars and traffic, you get more cars and traffic. It just keeps building. And you've gotten to that level at such a, you've done such a beautiful job of that. You have really almost destroyed your community, okay? So turn that upside down, and uh, when you design your community around people and places, you get people and places, right? But you don't have an agency in the, in the city that does that. You have your traffic engineers who are working every day to get that traffic to move faster. So turning that whole concept upside down, you will actually get an outcome that you will cherish uh, as in this community that you all love, rightfully love, and will make it systemically better. So the only way to make a busy road intersection safe is to make it feel dangerous. Sounds counterintuitive, but when you have an intersection like this, which is just a mumbo jumbo of junk, uh, literally, and you turn it into something like this, you've changed the whole concept of how that, that intersection works. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So if you want vehicles to behave like they're in a village, build a village. Uh, and essentially what that means is a transfer of power and responsibility from the state to the individual and the community. So this is coming back to you and how you are important in how you create your public spaces and streets are public spaces. Once they become public spaces again, they become yours. Right now they're not yours. Uh, and so you take an intersection like this, this is in Holland, North Holland, and you turn it into something like that. And you take all those stoplights out, and guess what? People slow down when they come into that intersection, and the, the engineer that did this, his whole concept in engineering was to create eye contact between the pedestrian and the driver. And that little contact, and you know this already, is where you, you greet someone, and they say, please go, or you go, I've been doing it here. You do it all the time. But how do you make that happen throughout the downtown and throughout the neighborhoods? Because that's where you start create the cordiality, the kind of connections, and the vehicles become less about a vehicle than about the people in it and you who are walking. So that's a paradigm shift. So, uh, so what happened when they did that, the accident rates went down dramatically, uh, and uh, <clears throat> we, we have this... Uh, traffic engineer who we got from New Jersey, which is the epicenter of hostile uh, engineering uh, in the world. Uh, and, but we released, we got him out, and he went to, he, he came over to, <laughs> to the Netherlands, and uh, we put him in the front, in the middle of this intersection uh, with someone else. And, uh, and this truck comes along, and there he is standing, he's in the middle of the intersection because people have just the same rights as a car, and uh, the, the truck goes by, and uh, so then, ha-ha, we said, okay, this is your come-to-Jesus moment, because we're going to put you in a chair <laughs> in the middle of that intersection. Okay, so he's never been the same since. He is alive. Uh, but... Uh, so how do you take an intersection and turn it into a public space or a square? So this is in uh, Buenos Aires, in a neighborhood much like many of the neighborhoods you have here, uh, with uh, businesses on each of the corners. There happen to be three of them, happen to be restaurants. And, uh, and look what happens. It's not mine, that's my ring, sorry. 
if, if it's my mother, I take it. Don't worry. She's 98 years old. Uh, so look what happens to the intersection. There are ballers there. Where do they sit? They sit on the road almost. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's, so there's actually eye contact between people and vehicles. This is a major road in that neighborhood. But at lunchtime and dinner, it slows down and becomes a shared space, like we showed. And when this guy from, with the balloons comes a, along, because that's where people are, he can't walk on the sidewalk, so he walks on the road. So, and then, you see there, and then uh, you start getting these unusual people. Unusual people like to be around normal people so they can be exhibiting themselves. And, uh, and they're characters, and you've got a lot of them here. Uh, and, you, and, and that's a good sign, that's a, and maybe that's a very healthy sign. Uh, and then, uh, you see, there they are. But then they also, the bollards become places to sit, you see? So you can't design a bollard just as a bollard. It has to be thought of as amenity as well. So, uh, so uh, now this is going, we're, we're going to be in Paris next week. And then we're going to Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia has these really critical social issues about the integration of sexes. And we're going to use public spaces to do that. So this is a place that is nice. We can all get up and dance. Uh, Rue de Bouki, if you've been to Paris, and you would go here. And this, is a, this street has traffic on it. Uh, never gets met. No one wants to come there in a car because you can't get through very easily. Uh, but the sidewalks are double loaded, double loaded sidewalks. You have, you have very narrow sidewalks here and you have some sidewalks that are pretty good. And how do you create activity that's on the street rather than just in the buildings? And, and they do the best job we've seen. So this is at nighttime. Uh, and you see how they do a, uh, oops. So here they have these big awnings. And then they'll have uses along uh, the curb. And, uh, and you can walk between the seating there. So guess what? You're, you're actually saying hello to people that you know there. Uh, and uh, you get a green building. Uh, and you get a double loaded corridor with, around a, a, a flower sh shop. And that's the corner. Uh, and then here you can get your food out here or you can go into the restaurant and what happens people come there and these two families are from connecticut a town in connecticut and they come and they say oh my god i didn't know you were here uh and so that's what happens in these good places and that's what happens here you coming down i was watching some of you over in the uh the cafe you're all coming there to say hello to each other oh and you get cafe at the same time coffee at the same time. Now this guy, these, this, these people have to be in that location because they get attention. So this is one of their top sites where they go to get attention. So this is the sort of, uh, they're re retro, but there's even a better term for them. But, there's, uh, but these, these are real characters and they love to pro project their characters. So, uh, and then in Detroit, this is so much like what you have here. Uh, that I'm going to show you, but Detroit, in uh, in maybe I get it over here. Okay, in 1917, this was the center of Detroit, and in the middle of that picture, there's a monument. It's called the Soldier, Soldiers and Sailors Monument, and in 1999, that monument did not move, but everything else left. Woody's was there. This was the center of Detroit in 1999. Detroit had evacuated. We started working in Detroit at that time and, uh, and, this, and, and got the public spaces back. But in 2013, uh, this fellow, Dan Gilbert, who owns Quicken Loans, uh, came and we gave a presentation in April of 2013 to 400 people about a lighter, quicker, cheaper placemaking activation plan. And uh, 
three months later, we took that and, and it turned it into this. And the Soldiers and Sailors Monument, we moved it a little bit, but uh, seems to be, uh, whoops, sorry about this. Kathy, you may want to come up and just sit there and, and move it. So, and so we put a beach right in front of the Soldiers and Sailors Monument. And that beach was put there the same month that Detroit went bankrupt. So that was sort of the tipping point for Detroit. So I look at that monument and I think of your circle out there. And I see this vast island of nothing all around that, a massive amount of space that is the worst use of space you could ever imagine. And you have created that. Or the traffic engineers created it. <laughs> So that's not your future. Uh, maybe you could put a beach there, that would be great. And then we started putting, and every, all of this is programmed. All of it is lighter, quicker, cheaper, and the whole place has become the center of Detroit and the center of the region. And in three years, it's been phenomenally successful. <laughs> I don't know if you like to travel, but uh, uh, we can't stay in one place for more than a weekend, frankly. Not that she likes that. But uh, this is Porto in Portugal, and it is the best waterfront I've ever been to in my life. And uh, next, Kathy, the, oh, go back, sorry. So you can see there's a road that comes down to the waterfront, and then on the waterfront is this amazing destination. There are cars that come down, taxis and stuff to bring people there, but they do not stay long at all. And next, the next ones. And so this is the waterfront. It has got about, it's about the same size as yours, differently configured, but people come from all directions to get there. And that's a temporary uh, restaurant because often in the wintertime that area floods. Uh, and there's a whole lot of experience around the world of temporary uh, activations that have to be taken out when the, when the weather gets bad. Bergen is another one. We've worked in, 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 in Bergen and in Stavanger, which is the next one. But done this exercise there, next. So this is historically what Bergen was like. So I think you should do this, because that tends to... So you see, this is called the octopus effect, and you've got one of the best octopus effects around. You've got streets going all the way out. You get to Main Street in different ways. Uh, it's very unusual to have such a complex set of streets that deliver you to the same place, and, and by car, but more importantly, by walking. And. And so this, you see, this has streets that go up outside, up into the hills and out into the neighborhoods. It does the same thing. Next, next one. Oh, and that's a market building. And then Stavanger is, yeah, that's a market building. Stavanger uh, is an incredible waterfront. Uh, and uh, we, were, we did some work there as well. Uh, and you can see how it, the town is on the right side and the historic uh, residential is on the left side. And uh, let's skip this. This is a roundabout uh, that works. And you, you, your roundabout is about 10 times bigger than this. And this one is smaller. And it's really amazing. I can show, show it later. It's hard to see in the back. Uh, so this is Stavanger, and if you look at this giant building that's in the uh, upper picture, it's not a building, it's a boat. And it can come into that harbor, but it's about a 12-story boat, and it's so out of context that I, I'd never seen anything like that. But this is how they treat the area as it comes down to the water. The main town is on the left, and the more residential areas on the right. 
And this is looking down as to what they have. And this is looking with the boats next to it along the... Like, you have the same thing there. So you all are going to have to travel in teams to go and look at these and bring those, those ideas back here. Because there is a street there, and then they do this. A lot of these things you do too, but you do things under the pressure of so much traffic that it becomes counterproductive. So, and then Helsinki is another city. The, the thing about Helsinki, and the next ones I'm showing you, are they have these, what they call esplanades. So you start up, like you do here, up at the top of the hill, and you actually went, wind your way down, and the more interesting it is, the less distance you think it is, and you participate all the way along. And this is at the end of the esplanade, and the only way you can get there is by streetcar. Uh, and so people are coming in great numbers. Uh, and next, and what they do on the on the pier is they sell fish. Uh, they have markets. It's a lot of temporary activity. It's the main destination in Helsinki. They have a market there too, market building. Uh, and this is the that's the Esplanade going up into the downtown. And the market is there all year round, winter time as well. Outdoor market in the winter. And this is the esplanade that comes down. And there are all these destinations along that esplanade. Uh, we're going to give you this PowerPoint. So if you want to look at it and share it with other people, you can. So you can think more about it. Go ahead. And Stockholm is the same thing. It's called the Kunstergarten. And they started in the middle of the town, and you come right down to the waterfront there. Uh, it's one of the great destinations uh, in northern Europe. And then Barcelona, if you've been there, the, the Rambla uh, brings you from middle of the city right down to the waterfront. And it may be, it's a very long distance, but you, it takes you, it's, the, the time it takes you seems so short. And yet it might be a half an hour or an hour because there's so much to do on that stretch. So the strategy for implementation, lighter, quicker, cheaper, energetic anchors of activity, crowdsource ideas, make it a movable feast, get life on the streets, bring the inside out. So you're seeing what is happening in some of the most prominent, best waterfronts around the world. And I think you can see how close you are to that. Uh, you are not far off. So you have not only the opportunity, but in a sense, the responsibility to do that. So the best of the best uh, is Paris. Uh, in the summertime, they take the bank along the, the right bank of the Seine and they turn it into a Paris plage. And it is unbelievable. And it's been copied all over the place. You have the potential of doing many of the kinds of things here. Uh, and all of these things you can do this summer. Uh, none of this is out of reach at all. It means you're going to have to work hard. But they take uh, the road <laughs> and create a beach on it. This is the main road along the Seine. And for six weeks in the summertime, it is a beach. Now, I, I know you're all going to come up with this idea for right out here. Uh, go ahead. And they have music and dancing and yoga and, and food. And it doesn't, it do, what? Bachi. All along there, it is one of the great public spaces of the world for that period of time. And a mister, because it gets you know very hot, so that cools you off. And uh, keep. Oh, <laughs> this is the library. The library on the beach. <laughs> okay. Now they even go further. This is the Louvre Museum <clears throat> on the waterfront. And this is their displays. <clears throat> They're not real, but, but they are. So this is an, you know, I mean, imagine this. So you've got all these resources here. Uh, so what do you put here? OK, uh, next. And on the other side, they have something called Les Berges. And it has also activated the waterfront. And you know, Paris was flooded in the, in the, this winter. So all of this comes out and goes back in. So they paint the ground. Brilliant. 
They use, they have shade structures, temporary shade structures with kiosks, food kiosks, just like that. They have these wooden planks that create platforms for performance or for sitting. And they have a game area. This is a game pavilion here. And uh, this is actually in Helsinki on the waterfront. And, uh, and this is in Brooklyn. We live in Brooklyn, New York. So you see what one crea really creative city does along the water that is absolutely fully public. You know, that brings everyone. And they call it the Perry Plage, or they call it, what is it, Perry, uh, the Rib Riviera? The, the beach, of, they don't, you don't have to go to the Riviera in the summertime, you've got your beach right there. So when you focus on place, you do everything differently. <laughs> and remember, this is what your mayor is doing, and what his whole persona is, is turning things upside down to get where you get the kind of quality outcome that you want. And he's exceptional. He really is. Uh, and I've, you know, we've been many places. So what you think about in terms of the levels of uh, programming, you know, it's those festivals, art installations, celebrations are a small part of what you do. The summer concerts, ice rinks, that's maybe another level. The farmer's market, food trucks, yoga classes, and then the daily activation. It's about making the daily activation work every day. Then you start getting it right. If you just focus on events, you're, you, it'll just be the event-driven uh, waterfront rather than a daily active place. So growth means complexity that you don't simplify. Cities, places generate complexity. So this isn't about making it neat, clean, and empty. It's about adding dimensions to it that give you the, what we call the power of 10, the reason that you want to be there uh, every day. You get out of bed and you want to come there because something is going on and you don't want to miss it. Then you have gotten to the level of success that will make this great. So Margaret Mead was one of my teachers uh, at Columbia. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens contains the world. Indeed, is the only thing that ever has. You see, what you can do here is create that organic, natural destination. What they've done in Washington is done one pretty good waterfront, but that's all privately owned. And so it's programmed. And it's not bad, it's good. But here you can get that kind of edginess. You can get the, you know, the different cultures. You can open it up for, for kids and you know, it becomes sort of spontaneous. And that's a real place. Like if you know New York, Bryant Park is the most incredible public space in the world, but it's also the most controlled public space. Union Square, you can find really strange people there. I think you should read that because it was, they had a... So never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So I'm getting... The, so the power of 10, and I'm getting to the end of my section, if you take uh, Annapolis and you think of your 10 destinations, uh, and then you say, do they have the multiple uses? Go to the next one. So that's Manhattan, and then the middle one is Bryant Park. And Bryant Park has probably 20 destinations uh, and each of those places has 10 things to do. So you go there and you do five things one day and you do three things the next day and so on. And so that's the kind of energy that, this, that the waterfront needs. And frankly, even the circle up there and West Street and the two circles, because those are pretty, pretty boring. I mean, the, one of the weakest connections is between West Street and Main Street, where there's four lanes of traffic and you feel like it's a, the Indianapolis Raceway right there. You're gonna, are you going to do the, your, your job is to, schedule. my schedule. So, so, 
So now we're, we're getting back to this, these circles, West Street, uh, Main Street, the main square, uh, and then the two points on the pier. Well, it's, we, they can't see that. Okay, do the next one, Kathy. Because the next one has it. So go, go to, okay, well, so let me, so, so a good public space, a great public space, good places breed healthy activity. People attract people, attract people. When you focus on place, you do everything differently. It takes many disciplines and skills to create a place. It takes a community to create a place. Amenities that make the place comfortable are critical. You can't know what you're gonna end up with. Each place has its own identity. <laughs> Any, I, I didn't read the last one. I, did, I didn't get the last one. So. so you can't have anything less than excellence. You see, this is really fundamental. If you don't have the places that nurture you and your family and your community, can we get a dog catcher? The dog park, yeah, well, that's, let's put, <laughs> there we go, we got one of our good ideas. Uh, and then it has to be a campaign, uh, and the campaign, I can't read it, Kathy. Oh, it says you have to have a vision, you have to have a vision. You have to communicate the vision. You search for impediments, and there are no impediments here. Uh, they just sort of get out of your way when you've got a good idea, frankly, that happens. Organize a strong team. Organize a strong team. Attack complacency, produce short-term wins, take on bigger challenge, and connect change to the culture of the community. So you see what happens as you go through this kind of community-led process, you begin to, it begins to be, gather steam, and things can happen all over because you now have realized how powerful uh, these lighter, quicker, cheaper ideas are. So the, the one requirement is that we have a big training program for zealous nuts, okay? And they are the ones that drive change. Uh, they are visionaries with a poorly developed sense of fear and no concept of the odds against them. They make the impossible happen. So that... <laughs> I don't have to say anything more. <laughs> that also has never happened. <laughs> See, that's who you all are. You're already there. Go ahead. I think that's it. Is that it? Yeah. So, so that's the first part of this. Uh, and uh, the next part, we, we can take a break. Uh, if you, at your tables, if you have any of these dots, there's some right there, uh, we could, uh, Brian? We, the, the, I don't think we have enough dots. Uh, all right. Okay. <laughs> Could, yeah, we could do that. Yeah, because you, 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 you do it. No, I'm not. I'm through. I'm done. No, I'm done. Kathy will answer the questions. Come here, come here. No, no, I don't get that. No, I, I, I have to sit down and put my leg up. So you have to do it. Yeah, you can sit. We'll sit with no, the I'm chair. Not, I'm here. Not, no, I'm not. Here, sit there. I mean. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so does anybody have a question? Oh, okay. We can put the chair on the stage because we want to be able to see you. So, sorry. There's going to be a lot of people watching the video. Let's hope. A lot of people watching the video. So, sit up here if you can. Is that okay, Bruce? Okay. See, it's Bruce's fault. It's all Bruce's fault right there. So, 
Do not fall off the stage. Okay, I saw one question. Hi. I'm just curious about how all those, those little streets that they get all their delivery from those shops and restaurants. You know, I, I've been wondering that too. It's a really good question. Oh, uh, <laughs> you, know, you know your small streets, those ones that are about this wide? Uh, um, she's been really means the wider ones. Uh, how do you get your deliveries? Well, when you go to Europe, uh, a lot of the deliveries are made in hand trucks or small trucks or even bicycles. We're seeing more and more bicycles making those deliveries. So you get these bigger trucks, they stop outside of the, the core and they, get a, they do that. So what happens is they will transition when they realize they can't get to where they need to get to today. Right now, there's just these massive trucks uh, in places that don't, they don't belong there. And they're there too long, and they take away from the experience. So people, you know, people want to buy, they want to sell, and they'll do it. They'll do what they have to do to get there. History, but lighter, cheaper, quicker implies to me that we have a significant issue that must be solved. And when I look at downtown Annapolis, and this is the question, do we have a significant issue that needs to be solved so fast? Um, that's all. I mean, what? So he's, he's asking about lighter, quicker, cheaper, and do we have a significant issue that needs to be solved? Uh, that's a question. Now, I'm, I'm going to say you are in deep doo-doo. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm really not kidding, because you do have such a big opportunity staring in your face. And if you don't take advantage of it, that's not to your credit. So it's, you know, it's so evident. And you all know this. Everyone is saying, we have too much traffic. We can't do this. I mean, you know, it's just flooded with cars. That's not your future. So, yes. So what, what's the benchmark for best cities to move people into the center without cars? Well, you see, what, you're, what this is doing, this is laying the groundwork for that to happen. This lighter, quicker, cheaper starts to morph into bike lanes, to better walking environments, to streets that are more multi-use, uh, to destinations that are along your neighborhood street, leading to a more commercial street. So the whole structure of your city will evolve as you begin to enter, as you begin to uh, create this. Uh, and it can take five years. But once you get started, it starts to gain momentum. And, and we live in Brooklyn, New York, and we do use our car in the summertime. You know, and there are 10 people that use it. Our two, two families live there. So we don't, driving is like, ugh, do we have to get in a car today? Uh, yeah. I'll start behind you first. Could you speak to the, uh, the structure of collaboration between citizens, the city, the private developers at the early stage? Well, when you, no, the, the, He's asking about how do you uh, build this, uh, this collaboration between the developer, the private citizen, and the government. Uh, and the way to do that is, uh, and we'll take this example right here. If you have a vision for how this place is going to be used, you start experimenting with it, it'll define how that development is designed. And then by zoning and those kinds of actions, you know, is it 70 feet high or 40 feet high? Or, those, are, those are governmental decisions, but how it actually fi uh, builds off of the uses. So architecture of place is how does architecture be part of the public space? Rather, we, and we have a big, we have a friend who's one of the biggest developers in Brazil, and he says, don't let the architects design the ground floor. And he's right. 
because the ground floor is the public it's the public connection uh, to the building and to the community. And how that's designed has an enormous impact on the value of the building, the kinds of uses, and how it is all woven together. So you're actually public space here is no longer just to the edge of the building, it goes into the buildings as well. So that's your public realm. It becomes much bigger than just the building face. You got to stand. So he's asking, what are the what's been done when you start doing the the downtown activation and placemaking and making it more more walkable to the next ring of the suburbs, and and what's happening and actually this is happening around D.C. where some of the neighborhood towns are becoming much more walkable. So it's it actually starts the the developers and property owners realize that they don't have a future if they don't transitioning to this. And then there's the whole bike movement. We run something called the National Center for Biking and Walking, and there's been a phenomenal shift in the high idea of walking and biking uh, nationally. So it's really it's. Well, okay, I didn't quite answer the question. He said, "What are the? There's so many little things that can happen." And it's those little things that add up. Well, if you have a sidewalk, you know, a sidewalk will have something. If you narrow the lanes and you have a bike lane that maybe is half bike, half walking. Where do the cars go? The cars are still there, but you don't use it every day. You know, you might walk three days a week to something and just go one day a week in a car. But your behavior patterns start to shift. And it's because you want to be in the environment because you now know your neighbors better. So it's just it's these little things. He's, he's saying I'm not answering the question, but but it is a kind of a, so we'll, we can talk later. Yes. I, this might kind of go on back to his, but you mentioned the octopus of yeah. the way that the, the roads work. So yeah. if, you, if you create a more walkable atmosphere that reduces the flow of traffic down here, which I think would be great, I still recognize a, a huge need for cars to be able to get through. Right different places, like if you have a house on that street and all of this is walkable, all right, so what are you doing? You're driving around all six streets to get that house instead of driving through. I would prefer a walkable space, but we recognize that there is a need for traffic to be able to at least flow out of downtown or through downtown, so how do you solve that? Well, it, it goes back to what I was saying, is that if you take a street and you begin to diversify the use of that street, so you can bike and you can walk, and you still have capacity on that street. The capacity may be slower uh, because it becomes more of a public space and more friendly place as a street, you know, like what's going on. I showed you the guy that in the Netherlands has wor worked in 175 communities, transitioning them from this high fo fo this focus on road mo uh, vehicle movement to placemaking in all kinds of neighborhoods. And he's been phenomenally successful doing just these, you could almost call it modifications, road modifications to make them more pedestrian and, 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 and bicycle friendly. And then destinations too, you know, like you saw the intersection in Buenos Aires, that's happening in a lot of places because now you go to that intersection, it's because it's a place, not just because it's another place where cars go back and forth. Yes? A major complication here you just touched upon very briefly is sea level rise and the very frequent mm -hmm. flooding of this the space you're talking about, all the way up to lower Main Street. So factor that in. Uh, Paris floods every year. Uh, Venice floods in the in the winter time. Uh, People get on platforms. Uh, this is not a good answer, but it's what happens in communities where that is happening. 
Uh, Porto, which I showed you, there's a flood every year. So they've factored that in. Uh, but I still think you need to raise the level of, of the uh, plazas and the road here. I know there's a, a low level over there. So you do have to do both. But uh, if you drive it so that you go to seven feet or something like that, which is maybe in 150 years, I don't know what it's going to be, that's too much because then it takes you away. So there's probably a, a, a series of levels and ways to mitigate to make it more resilient that also accommodate the uses that you, you all want. So, yes. So many families here have had businesses for generations. And I know that one of the concerns is when you have drastic change, how is it going to impact those businesses? So could you just speak to what happens in these cities when you have these sudden outdoor spaces and how does that affect businesses like restaurants you want people coming in? Yeah, so it's, it's how do you factor in the sort of older uh, businesses that have been here a long time? How do you uh, have the people continue to support them to come into the, into the buildings? I, I really think a lot of the restaurants have got to get outdoors. So they have an outdoor, but you know, in some places there are actually pavilions where there's a pavilion on the, on the sidewalk, on a wider, and the, and the restaurant. So you, you have the restaurant inside and the pavilion outside, and you've got it working. And I showed you some of those pictures in Paris where those restaurants do most of their business on, this, on the sidewalk. So as you become to get in, take the inside out, you do that. Now the other thing that you, you don't have a good system for incubating new businesses, and that's what markets are for and by having a daily market where people can come in and try to build their business through that and eventually into a bigger stall, eventually into a, a, a true retail establishment. You don't have that mechanism and markets are a key mechanism for that. I can't see back there, but we'll start with you and then, then you and then you and then you, you, you. Well, I think this, the whole downtown core is really incredibly walkable. It's really as good as a walkability as I've seen in Europe, in many of the cities in Europe. Uh, it's just that it seems like there's a kind of uh, addiction to the car that uh, is maybe a little bit more than uh, we see in some other cities. But you're not, a, you're a city. I mean, you have a very compact, extraordinarily busy s with yeah. I actually do live down here. Yeah. There's not a way to live here and not get in a car to go get my basic services. Uh, yeah. And that's what I'm trying to get to. I don't want to be yeah. dependent on my car, but I have to be I walk here, but to live my daily life, I have to get my car and exit the city to go to all of my primary commercial shopping, drug dealing, you name it. And how, you know, and, and I work outside of the city. There are most of the people who live here. 
don't work in the city. So there's a, a, an unfortunate dependence on cars even if we don't want to be. And how do we then envision the city with those obstacles and a lack of public transportation? Well, clearly one of the things you're going to get is a market downtown. And it could be a daily market. Uh, we live in Brooklyn and we have farmers markets uh, every day of the week in different locations near where we live. And uh, we get most of our food from the farmers market. But you, you want, you're saying something. Well, I was going to say that in, in grocery stores, all the companies yeah. I would venture to say that you could. What, what about the market building? Are they going to have any food? Uh, it's just a restaurant. Okay, so you're, I, we, we don't need to go into this anymore, but what you're really saying is one of the key things you need are, are some daily markets and then eventually a daily store that has the kinds of things you want or a series of them. Yeah, and, and so those are one of the biggest priorities that would help you to not have to walk I mean, drive all, as much as you do. So if you can take three trips out because you, a week, that because you have something to do here that you need, that would be great. You know, when we, when we moved to Brooklyn, uh, it was, wasn't too long before we moved there, but we actually had a fellow that came around on a horse, on, in a horse-drawn wagon delivering vegetables on the street. And I'm sure that if you go back and look over history here, there was a, probably a lot of people delivered things right to your front door. It was a, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, what I showed you in Helsinki, yeah, so it's not that far. You're in the back there, right, right there. You're... Um, so in Annapolis, when we talk about these kinds of changes that would make downtown more approachable, do you also get into the kind of the <laughs> uh, that's such a great statement. It's so hard to do that. But I actually have one to challenge you, which I haven't mentioned to anyone yet. Your market building is not a good market building. How do you create a market building that is historic in character, but functions like the historic markets did function? That building is so hard to make work. It's a fortress, and it's too low. You need a second level with a deck to look out over. Uh, so I, that's where, uh, you know, and I think you create a much more historic environment by doing that. Uh, but that's, so I let the bag, cat out of the bag. So I think you have to really look for a level of excellence, but use the character of architecture that was historic because the character, the historic character was much more connected to the public spaces. It was much more a part of the public spaces. Like that awful building, the Chamber of Commerce building, is, you know, that's an atrocity in a city like this. How could it ever have happened? The 80s. The 80s. Yeah, okay, we're going to go back and then come back to you. Yeah. Oh, you're next. You're the next one next after him. I'm going to the left or right. You're definitely next. But they all 
stop at the perimeter before you get downtown. We have the opportunity, it's been done in Manhattan, it's been done in DC, to get bike lanes or trails in here. But I know we will face, we'll face resistance. We'll face resistance from drivers, we'll face resistance from people, uh, uh, cherished parking spaces. How do we overcome the resistance so that we can get net the network and get people down here without cars? So what, what I think you do is you share the space, you share the road, and you actually put bike, bicycle figures on the road and, and talk about it as being shared. And the speeds come down uh, by the way you design the road. Uh, and so you're, you know, everything you can modulate, everything a little bit to make it more bike, ped, pedestrian, bike and pedestrian friendly. But if you take and create bike lanes, and that prevents the sidewalks from becoming wider and more functional and more dynamic, you're losing. So there's this, it's a very fine line, but the traffic speeds are such that you could accommodate bikes and cars together as you create this more shared environment. And that's the way to go. And you, sir, are next. I came when I was in about a meeting, this meeting, and I was very enthused about it because I thought about what people are going to get saying. Oh, we're going to get the fresh fruits from the farmers to come back downtown and have a stand where people get fresh fruits. Utilize the walk outside the world when I grew up as a kid. When people come in and get your fresh fruit, the fresh vegetables, and all of the things they need. But all of a sudden, I hear all of your plans excluding having transportation downtown, using the cars from downtown, which means you're forcing a business that's out of, uh, uh, out of business that's been here since the 20s. What about the people like me who live in the city, work in the city, depend on the city to keep a roof over her head? Your plan about the city and increasing the city sounds real good. I like it. Except for the Detroit one, because we all know what happens in Detroit when they get the downtown. The four section just faded right out. We oh, well, we worked, we worked at. Yeah, yeah, okay. All I'm saying is, you've worked out great plans, but you've excluded the taxi cab industry. You're talking about pushing us away from downtown. That's my list. Everybody's not rocket scientists. Some of us got to do the mediocre job, mediocre job. I'm just saying, you got to think about us too. And the, the plan just seems to push cabs down and cars from downtown. Can I jump in on that? I think it's a big point that I'd like to talk about. Okay. Yeah, so just going back to you, the area right next to the market building where they put that uh, landscaping, those should be produce market stands. Used to be. And they used to be there. Put them back. Uh, because that's the central, that's your central square right there. And to put that landscaping there took away those possibilities. Uh, and then you don't, a lot, there's, when you look at the space, public spaces that are allocated for streets, it's way out of proportion to the amount of vehicles. Like if you look at that circle, only about 20% of that circle is used for cars. The rest is all open asphalt space that you don't need. So there's lots of room for you in special places where people can come to get in your cab. There should be a stand in a key location, and you can offer that. And also a public transit to go, you know, up. You should have public transit. I don't know, maybe you do. I don't. You know, that could be fixed. We feel like it's too much 
125 cans in the city of Minneapolis with four parking spaces. Four. After 6 o'clock, two of them shut down because it's not enough. Okay, so that's a good idea. So that's one of the ideas is to do that. Great. And we need an emergency route to get out of town, too. Yeah. Because if you're out on the peninsula, there's only one way out. So okay, well, that all goes into, but there's a transportation plan that that goes. We're talking about a public space plan that will give people reasons. I mean, they both they both are needed. Yes. First of all, it's great to be a living former student of Margaret Mead. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you know what she was like? She was not an academic. She was a highly uh, integrated human being that said that didn't, didn't want a lot of academic work. She wanted more common sense. She taught me common sense. She said, if you're going into dangerous neighborhoods, just go anywhere you want and have $10 in your pocket. <laughs> yeah. Yes, right. Yeah. And LA went to hell for the next hundred years. Right. And what you're doing in Detroit and other cities, addressing traffic flow and maintaining and preserving jobs. I'm very much concerned uh, as a new resident in Eastport. There's no. I got on a circulator last night that started at a beautiful hotel, went as far as here, but not across the bridge. Yeah, I mean, that's a great, what you said is terrific. We, we have a place in Delray Beach, Florida, and uh, you can't get anywhere near the downtown on a Friday night. So what they have are these, these, uh, these uh, six passenger electric vehicles uh, that are free. What? They're golf carts that are free. They go to the three or four miles outside of town, take people in and you give them a tip, you don't have to pay. And there's advertising on it, and they have real character, and there must be 15 of them. The really and the restaurant sponsor them. So, you know, that's a creative outcome. Uh, and there are others like that, other systems like that around. So I think that when things get harder, people start to realize there's money in that. And instead of the streetcar driver, they now drive these little things, and then the streetcar will come back, as it is in Detroit, there's a streetcar that did come back in Detroit. And that's, so, you know, we're back on track. And 70 years, we've been destroying our communities through the silos. And now we're, we finally come to realize that that's not what we want, and we want a different outcome. And all of the things you're saying are part of that outcome. And they're all important. And there's balancing, but you've got to, but the idea of lighter, quicker, cheaper, is what gets you doing things and experimenting with things and seeing what works and do something bold and make a mistake and fix it and it gets better and better and it's an it's an iterative process and it isn't done by the economic development team or the design team or the planning team it's done by people in the community that's that's the message the community is the expert and it's been 
you know, for 40 years we've been doing this and we've worked in 3,000 communities, 54 or 55 countries next week, uh, and it works. So, Ms. Lee, There's two or a couple she, more. She has a question because it, it concerns the next uh, several hours. So why don't you explain the how this day will go on? Well, no, you just ex give the schedule. I mean, I can tell you. No, I can tell you the details, but just say so. I'm tired of talking. People, <laughs> help me. People may, you know. Okay, I'll just say something. But, but no, just stay there. Um, we're gonna get. We're gonna have a little bit of. It's called a break. But then we're having a. Um, we call it the public space evaluation exercise. We call it the place game, and what that means is. It, what that means is that um, there will be a brief presentation first, and then we're going to divide in, into groups and then go out. Storefronts can have, uh, you know. Uh, uh, outdoor table seating all over the place. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this should be all. Yeah. It really, honestly, it's it's mostly just a parking space. You know, you don't have. No one has to really drive. To this. does appear to be accessible to almost anyone. Um, what would we like to see as short-term improvements with low, low cost? Uh, more seating, more comfortable seating, and even maybe some tables with seats. More shade, so more plantings. Um, maybe a designated area for stroller parking so that when people bring their kids down to play, they can park the stroller somewhere else. The primary objective of that space is to uh, provide public facilities for people. You have the restrooms, you have a visitor center. Um, you know, they have a lot of nice features there, but I don't think that they're, the architecture and the space normally it, like enhances that, that experience for people at that spot. Um, so those are a couple of the items that we... we <laughs> closure of Dodge Street to cars, going even further than stopping cars just up at the uh, house here, but all the way back there. Uh, wider crosswalks, eliminate parking, no overnight parking, signage and community information. I think this comes up on everybody's list almost, and we'll see it come up again. Uh, Long-term redesign of the industry. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my name is Karen Jennings. I was the note taker for our group. So, um, as Jim said, we, we did Memorial Circle. Some of the things that we liked about um, the circle right now is the view is spectacular from there. Um, it's really the, that position is the gateway to our harbor. It's really the true foot of Main Street. It's, it's so centrally located to every single other thing we're talking about. It's really like the center of 
They're going up Main Street. I'm looking towards Eastport. I'm looking at the water. It, so it's kind of strange. Pushing out the benches closer to the sidewalks and using it as a flexible space for uh, musicians, for artists, for market um, city docks so all the way up to the circle, sure. but it could be, um, or it can be to that first traffic light. Um, and not on a permanent basis, but to see um, in season, are there things that we can do in there that make people enjoy the space and use it, but not detract from the businesses that are on the street. Um, we'd also looked at um, potentially reversing the traffic direction because there is no better view than coming down Main Street and seeing all of it.